Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. Lab number one is due today. Hopefully that's not a shock to anyone. Homework number three is due in a week, and we'll actually talk a little bit about some of the problems on homework number three. That's one of our goals today. Hopefully you're thinking about homework three. Maybe you've already finished homework three, but if you haven't looked at homework three, I would suggest that we start looking at it and maybe our subconscious will start helping solve that pro those problems given a week's time to do it instead of looking at those Monday morning of next week. So let's give ourselves a chance on that so that we are even better prepared for exam number two, which is coming up quicker than we might think, and that's on the 19th of October. As I said, we'll try to work through some homework three clarifications or suggestions or helps, some hints on homework number three. We'll go through an example of computing the eigenvalues of a system matrix A, and then we'll jump into chapter four. So we're going to be moving quickly now through chapters three, four, and five, I think, before exam number two as a hint to where we are headed. Homework three is due, as I said, in a week, but one of the problems maybe is a little bit wordy, I know we love word problems, but hopefully today I'll help clear that up a little bit. But it's concerning a solar collector, which maybe today is not what we're thinking about as collecting solar energy, but we're collecting water today in buckets, I hope, or maybe. But here, X sub 1, we have a two-state system and it's trying to model this solar heating system using solar energy. And one of the states is the temperature deviation from a desired equilibrium temperature. The second is the temperature of the storage material or the water tank. And then we have three what I'm going to say, you could probably think of these as controls. Two are labeled as inputs, and the third, D, is a disturbance, but all of those are now really can be classified as inputs. You have an input disturbance, which is the solar disturbance, clouds going across the sky. We'll model that as an input source D. It's a disturbance input. U sub 1 and U sub 2 are the different flow rates. One is just conventional heat, which I think in this problem we simply set equal to zero. And U sub 2 is the flow rate of solar heat. And you're given the dynamics. You don't have to derive the dynamics of this system. You have the time rate of change of X1 and X sub 2 given or stated in the problem, as well as the following you're given that for all time t greater than or equal to zero, that's when we're starting this simulation or exercise, you're assuming that u1 is zero. So the conventional heat source is not turned on or not being used. It's zero. And in this expression for x1 dot, you could simply forget u1 is there in this problem. u1 is zero. u sub 2 is a constant. It's 1 and D is a constant, it's also one. And now maybe you're starting to see this in a block diagram or all integrator structure to maybe help you feel or get a sense of how these variables are connected or interrelated. And in this case, they're not very coupled. Look at the first differential equation x1 dot or x1 prime is 3x1 plus, and in this case, it's just 1. u sub 2 of t is 1 for t greater than or equal to 0. That's just a first order differential equation. x sub 2 prime is 2x sub 2 
plus u sub 2 plus d, but those are both equal to 1 for all time. So now you have 2 driving x sub 2 as an input or forcing term, and it's coupled, by, it's coupled to itself and itself only. So again, this is a first order differential equation. So really, this problem, you're addressing two first order differential equations that are decoupled and you're being asked to simulate those or come up with, not simulate, but find a solution or find the time rate of change of x sub 1 and x sub 2. Based on what you have in front of you, so we're treating the disturbance d like an input, maybe I want to ex make this a little bit smaller so that you can see it. I want you to now help me fill in the blanks. First, relative to the input vector where I'm assuming d of t like it's an input, so I have three inputs, how many columns do I have in the B matrix? I should have three columns in the input matrix. And what are those columns? Or what are the entries or elements in that? Or how tall is the B matrix? It's two, so it's a two by three input matrix. Based on, well now it's maybe not clear from that expression right above, but if we use this one, if you can memorize that, how do you fill in the input matrix now? What's the, B, what's the first row of the B matrix based on having U1, U2, and D as inputs? Is it clear what I'm trying to get you to think about? The first row of B right here is going to be made up of something that scales U1, something that scales U2, and something that scales D. And that's determined by this first differential equation. Hopefully from that you can see that, well, in the B matrix here we would need 1 times U1, 1 times u sub 2, and 0 times d to create this dynamical equation in the first row. x1 prime is equal to, and now let's fill in the top row of the system matrix A. It's something times x1 plus something times x2. What's times x2? zero. So there's a zero there and there's a three right there. Now let's do the same approach to the second row of A and B. What's in the system matrix or the A matrix in the second row? How much, what constant scales or weights x sub 1? Nothing. So we have zero here and we have two there. What about the input matrix B? I don't want any U of one going into that. I do want a U sub two and I do want a D. And I think part of your problem is asking for a state space represent or matrix representation. You're welcome. <clears throat> you now have that if this is one of the parts of that question. And now, in order to obtain an answer, and from this system matrix, do you see how it is decoupled? Do you have any off diagonal entries in this system matrix A? x2 does not impact x1 or x1's time rate of change and x2 does not impact x1 or I don't know if I said them both but I was trying to say them both 
the 1, 2 entry and the 2, 1 entry in the A matrix are both zero. You have no off-diagonal terms. So you should be able to, with that decoupled behavior, solve this if you, and I'm assuming one of the prerequisites for this class is differential equations. Now you have a first order differential equation, two of those to solve to find the time rate of change of x1 and x2. The next homework help is basically just telling you where all of these leading characters in front of the problem number come from. CP, problem CP 3.4. Sounds like we're in Star Wars or something, CP, anyway. C is computer, P is problem. So we have a computer problem and this is asking you to use MATLAB and I would suggest that you refer to sections 3.9 and 3.10 in the textbook and it basically steps you through the different MATLAB commands. Another prerequisite for this class is 3.10 by implication. You take that in the same semester as 3.20 and 3.10 you're supposed to be getting MATLAB. You should have enough MATLAB skills to solve this problem with the aid of the instructions that are provided in section 3.9 and 3.10. Now what we want to do is talk about the next. Are there questions on homework 3? How many have completed homework three? Good. But that wasn't a real strong completion percentage. But you now have a week to finish that if you haven't. And if you were paying attention, maybe now you know which classmates, if you have questions, you can start asking. You have a week. Let's now look at this connection between the poles of the transfer function, G of S, and the eigenvalues of the system matrix A. We derived those relationships last time. So now we know that the poles of the transfer function actually equal the eigenvalues of the system matrix A. And that comes by just looking at some of this information. What's cheer one tell us if you now have if I give you a B C and D cheer one tells us how to find the transfer function G of s is and if you don't remember cheer one you can derive it you know the Laplace transform how to apply that to this system dynamics x prime so this is now c si minus a inverse b plus d to see the connection of poles of g of s so g of s now if it's a if it's a single input single output system this is now a rational expression in terms of the laplace variable s you have s is in the numerator and s is in the denominator of this transfer function g of s. The poles are the values of s that cause your denominator to vanish. So those are in the denominator. And now if we recall what si minus a inverse, how to compute the inverse of a matrix, that's 1 over the determinant times this cofactor matrix transposed or the adjoint matrix of SI minus A. That cofactor matrix transposed is what is in the numerator of the G of S because you're going to pre-multiply by C and post-multiply by B if it's one input one output that collapses that 3 by 3 adjoint matrix into a scalar. That cofactor matrix transposes in the numerator. What's in the denominator? The determinant of SI minus A. And that's 
the same as the poles of G of S, as we just had said. So now we have the poles of G of S are the roots of determinant of SI minus A, and the definition of eigenvalues is right there. They're the values of S that satisfy the determinant of SI minus A equal to zero. And we set that characteristic polynomial, SI minus A's determinant, equal to zero. That gives us our characteristic equation. And the characteristic equation gives us the characteristic roots or what then are used to find the modes of our system, how our system behaves naturally. If I gave you this example, and I think this is the example that we have worked with before, you can't immediately see the eigenvalues. This is not a diagonal matrix. It's not a triangular matrix, upper triangular or lower triangular. So the eigenvalues are not explicitly on the diagonal of this matrix. If you have an Inspire, an 89 calculator, you can quickly plug that in to the function eigval, VL, and find the eigenvalues for that matrix. And you'll find that they're minus 1 and minus 2. And those are not clearly evident by looking at that 2 by 2 matrix. What if we wanted to do that by hand? Calculate the eigenvalues of A. We said those are the values of S that satisfy this characteristic equation. We just have to do a determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix. And I'm assuming that you know how to do. By hand, then, we're looking at lambda i minus a equaling 0. Or we now have lambda plus 3. Lambdas are on the diagonal and we subtract the A matrix, we have a minus 1 here and a 2 there, and we need to take the determinant of that and eventually set that result equal to 0. In this case, we multiply the, or we form the product of the diagonal terms and subtract the off-diagonal terms and there's our characteristic polynomial. We now know our characteristic equation is that polynomial set equal to zero. And if you're good at factoring quadratics, you can see that that has two factors that involve real coefficients. We have one root of that characteristic equation living at a value lambda. I don't know why I picked lambda, but those are usually what you use for eigenvalues. So before I said the definition was s. It doesn't matter what variable you use. Just set that quadratic to 0 and find what variables solve it. In this case, we can see then that lambda sub 1 is equal to minus 1. If we substituted that value of lambda into that equation, we would get 0. Likewise, a second eigenvalue we could say is minus 2. Those eigenvalues then tell us how the system is going to behave if it's excited or if we have initial conditions or if it's energized in some way, the modes of this system are now given by e to the lambda 1t and e to the lambda 2t, or e to the minus t and e to the 2t. Does that provide you any useful information if you're thinking about this problem? Knowing the eigenvalues and then the modes. That's like knowing the poles. 
the poles are at minus 1 and minus 2 in this particular system matrix. You now know the modes are at e to the minus t and e to the minus 2t. We're going to have all three cheers today. Here's cheer 3. We're maybe not in the right order. We did cheer 1. Cheer 3 was... Anybody remember? Phi of t is equal to e to the a t. And that matrix exponential now says that it's going to contain linear combinations of these modes. e to the minus t and e to the minus 2t will be floating around in that phi of t expression. That's what the modes tell you. The elements the elements are those four entries in the phi of t matrix are linear combinations and you know what those look like e to the minus t e to the minus 2t What's the time constant on e to the t, e to the minus t? So now you're looking at what time would cause that exponent to equal 1. Or my, forget the minus, but you're now setting that quantity that's negative something in the exponent equal to 1. And you're saying, what's the time? What time would cause that to happen? And that's t equal one. For e to the minus two t, what's its time constant? What would cause two t? What t would cause two t to be one? One half. <laughs> so now the e to the minus two t is twice as fast as e to the minus t. And if you were thinking about how these are going to behave, e to the minus 2t is going to be gone after five of those time constants, or two and a half seconds. e to the minus t will be gone after five time constants, or after five seconds. That's how they play together. One is twice as fast as the other. That's chapter three. Now we're ready for chapter four or we're moving into chapter 4, whether you're ready or not. So now let's... Chapter 4 is dealing with feedback. And our conventional, or our, let's say, classic block diagram is we have a system, or in some cases that might be a system and a controller combined into one transfer function. We might have some dynamics in the feedback path. We have a reference input and an output Y. But now in chapter four, we're interested in feedback and what feedback can do. This is a feedback configuration of a system. We might actually be interested in this signal E, which sometimes is called the air signal, and it makes even more sense to call it an air signal when that feedback path is just one, or unity. When H of S is one, E, that signals transform is now the difference between the reference and the output. So if you're trying to command your system to go to R and H is 1, you want to make E go to 0. You're trying to drive the air to 0. You're comparing R with Y and the output of that comparison is E. And that air then drives your plant to go to Y. Suppose now that we want the transfer function between R and E. 
Isn't that just one? <laughs> Being a little bit facetious, it's not because you have all these signals floating around. But don't be misled to think, well, the transfer function between R and E, they're just right next to each other. One's just on the other side of that summing junction. Isn't it just one? And it's not. So now we have to find this transfer function between R and E. You know the transfer function between R and Y. That's cheer 2. Yes, that's G over 1 plus GH. What's the other one? The transfer function between R and E. Well, let's derive it. It's not that complicated of a block diagram. You've seen many more complicated block diagrams than that. What's our strategy? Well, let's start finding the output of the summing junction or what that equals. E of S is now equal to R of S minus, how far do we want to go back? Well, now we just start going back as far as we want in terms of that signal that's forming part of E of S. E of S is the output of the summing junction. R of S is one of the inputs. The other input is minus HY. Or we could just keep going since we want the transfer function between R and E. We want our equation to just contain R's and E's. Terms involving R's and E's. We can just keep going back. It's not that complicated, this block diagram. We can say, well, Y is really GE. So now we have HGE as the input coming in through that minus connection on the bottom input signal of that summing junction. This is now minus G of A, S, H of S, E of S. Maybe I should have written it in the form that I said it before. H of S, G of S, E of S. And the reason I can change those is because they are scalars and they commute. If they weren't scalars, you do need to preserve the order of their product. Now we can solve this for the transfer function. We collect all of the terms that have, and now I am going to rotate those because it'll be more consistent with what we're used to saying alphabetically, GH. And now what do we have for E? Now we have our transfer function E of S, or our air signal, is now 1 over 1 plus G of S, H of S, times R of S. And this is the transfer function between the reference input R and the air signal E of S. And hopefully I've convinced you that that transfer function is not just one. The transfer function between R and E is 1 over 1 plus GH. And that should sound familiar to you. If you needed to find Y in terms of E, that's G8, I'm sorry, GE. And now you have the transfer function between Y or between R and Y. And that's cheer two. So if you wanted to check your work, you could say, oh, Y of S, I remember that cheer. I don't remember what it really means, but I remember the cheer. But then you could draw all of the block diagrams and everything else that you need. That's G over 1 plus GH times R. And that actually checks relative to what we just found for the transfer function between R and E.
because we know that y is GE. Questions on that derivation? You're going to be wanting to know, maybe, throughout chapter 4, what the transfer function between R and E might be, because this tells us what's happening with feedback. If we had no feedback, what would be the transfer function between R and E? From the block diagram, if we disconnected the feedback, what is the transfer function between R and E? 1. And you can see that now in this transfer function. You set H equal to 0 and you get 1. Another way to check your work by looking at extreme conditions or extreme situations. But that's now how feedback helps improve the system properties. Why? Well, that's what we're going to discover in Chapter 4. But this now says that if I inject a reference signal, it somehow gets filtered to produce the error. It's getting filtered by this transfer function 1 over 1 plus GH. Let's now look at some of the properties of feedback. One property of feedback is that it reduces steady state air. Where do you apply feedback? Probably daily. Driving, either you're driving, well, well, here I'm thinking of an automobile, but you could also be driving another vehicle, a bicycle, a motorcycle. But in driving, what are two of the key inputs that you have if you're driving? Steering. and gas, right? And you're constantly staying between the lines, hopefully. That's feedback. You're sensing where your car is relative to where it needs to be, and you're correcting for that as you're steering. You're also adjusting your gas in case the car in front of you decides to slow down for whatever reason, you hopefully don't rear end. How many have adaptive cruise control in their vehicles? Not, oh, a few show of hands. But now that's, I think, designed to try to what? Accommodate for somebody in front of you not going the speed that you really wanted to go. And how did that get created? Somebody probably had a controls class in order to figure out how to design this adaptive cruise control. All right, so steady state air. That's something that feedback allows us to reduce. Another property of feedback is it improves stability. And we'll fall back on our classic stability that you can practice at home. You can go get a yardstick or a meter stick, where whatever you feel comfortable with or whatever you have, and try to balance that, or I guess these table markers, you could start trying to balance that. Not all at once. Sorry, I guess... You're multitasking, and I heard this morning that we're experts at not multitasking. Anyway, what's another balancing stick? Well, if you took a bike in to work, that's an inverted pendulum, essentially. Now, 
that feedback helps you stabilize that system. You're constantly adjusting your pedaling and your balance in order to maintain stability. Then when you have a flat tire as some poor guy had this morning, I heard this and the tube was actually coming out of the I go, oh boy, you're not fixing that easily. So I hope he quit pedaling. But he was bound and determined. It was raining. Oh well. But he, he was stably upright, I believe. Another property of feedback is it reduces sensitivity. So we have to put in a new word here, and this is what we're going to work on now the rest of the time, is this concept of sensitivity. But this sensitivity is really the feedback improving sensitivity is it's trying to be helpful in accommodating uncertainties in your system. Suppose now that we are still back on the bicycle. How does that change when you are going to class and maybe in the weekend? Well, maybe on the weekend it's more difficult, maybe because you're going to the store and you're trying to accommodate groceries. Going to class, you maybe have a backpack on, but your system has changed, has it not? With, you, with a backpack or not, your system is actually different, but you can still keep that bike stable. Well, you've now used feedback to help reduce the sensitivity of the change in the system to the stability of the bicycle. So now I ride a bike with and without a backpack. Those are kind of maybe silly systems, but they're everyday systems and they do allow us to maybe start understanding what feedback actually is. Now let's look at this concept of sensitivity from a more theoretical perspective. If we're talking about sensitivity, we're assuming that there's something changing in our plant or in our system. Suppose there is uncertainty. in system parameter values. And where do you have uncertainty in parameter values in electrical and computer engineering? Where is maybe one of the first things that you encounter that has some variation in it in electrical and computer engineering? Hint, do you have any bands on a resistor, tolerance bands? Those resistors that you get from the stock room, Josie probably doesn't have 0.001% resistors that she's handing you. I hope she's not handing you those. Those are a little costly. What's she give you? Some 5%, some 20% resistors? But now you want your system to behave the same if you have 105 ohms and somebody else puts in a 95 ohm in their circuit. You still want the system to behave about the same. You want to reduce the sensitivity. So you've had now resistors that might be plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10%, plus or minus 20%. Well, what about a system that we've worked with in this class winding resistance in a motor. That now changes as the motor is being used. It gets hot. For instance, 
winding resistance. of an electric motor changes as the temperature as you continue to use that motor, as the motor temperature rises. If you've designed a good control system, hopefully it won't matter if that motor just started up or if it's been running for two hours or six hours, your behavior of the controlled system better be the same or very close. A good control system should maintain here we'll say satisfactory performance in the face of parameter uncertainties. or when we have variations in our system. So now let's define what we mean by sensitivity. Suppose that we have a system which we typically maybe call the plant Suppose the system changes by a s some amount. Let's call it some delta G of S. For whatever reason, resistor values, motor wind, armature winding resistance, etc. But now we have a delta G. How does the transfer function change? as a result of those changes in the plant delta G or if our transfer function is T what's delta T? If we had a good design maybe delta T would be very small relative to delta G but we're going to talk about that in terms of relative relationships between the change in our transfer function and the change in our plant. We want to normalize those or make them relative to the size of our plant and the size of our transfer function. We're going to examine relative changes. Meaning, if I now have a delta T, I'm going to normalize that by the original transfer function T, and look at that relative to delta G over G. And this is our quantity of interest. This is our sensitivity. How does our transfer function change relative to changes in our plant? Delta T over T over delta G over G. And now since you've had all the background mathematics, we like to not play with deltas as much as we like to play with what? We want that delta to go small. Now we're looking at very small changes or making, looking at limiting values. So now in a differential setting, 
In other words, we're going to let delta G go to this partial of G and delta T partial of T. So in a differential setting, this ratio is called the sensitivity. of the transfer function. T of s to changes in the system or plant G of s. And we actually give that a notation. We call that the sensitivity of T with respect to G. And we define it in the following way. We say the sensitivity of T with respect to G is now defined as the partial of T over T. Again, it's relative over the partial of G with respect to, or partial of G over G. T is a transfer function, G is a transfer function, G is in the denominator of the denominator, so if we multiply it by 1, G over G will end up with G over T, partial of T with respect to G. And that's now the sensitivity of T with respect to G. We take the, op we take the plant's transfer function G, divide it by the transfer function t and then find the partial of the transfer function with respect to g. And we can have another form for that if we recall from calculus what happens when we differentiate the natural log. What happens when we differentiate the natural log? Now that goes in the basement, doesn't it? So it's now 1 over f df of x dx. And with that, now we can also rewrite or define this sensitivity of t with respect to g as the partial of the natural log of t over the partial of the natural log of g. And that's another equivalent expression. What I want to do now is compare sensitivities. And a simple way of comparing or looking at this is to compare the sensitivity of an open loop transfer function versus a closed loop transfer function. So now let's look at the open loop transfer function. Let's say T open loop of S versus the closed loop. transfer function, let's say TCL of S. What's the sensitivity of those relative to each other? Suppose we look at now the open loop scenario. What's the transfer function between R and Y? There's no cheer involved here, is there? That's just G of S. So can you expect, can you already predict the answer? <laughs> 
how sensitive, what's the sensitivity of this open loop transfer function to changes in G? If I wiggle G, if I change G, how's the open loop transfer gonna, function going to change? It's going to change exactly the same as G. So the sensitivity of the open loop transfer function with respect to the plant is 1. What we will do maybe after class, I think I'm going to have to release you to the weather, but the open loop and the closed loop, the open loop sensitivity is 1. We hope that the closed loop is less than 1. And we'll see how that changes or what that looks like maybe in the after class notes.